choosing sunscreen for your child and want to know which is the best one and how to apply it? Or does your child have a mole and you're concerned maybe it needs to be further evaluated? We're going to discuss those topics in today's episode and more. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Good morning. We're back at Beacon Pediatrics. It's a beautiful summer day outside, as you can see. Um, And so today I thought we would talk a little bit about sun protection, um, as well as some of the um, different types of moles that kids can have and when those are concerning. So let's start off by talking about sun protection. There's two main different types of sunscreens um, in the way that they work. So that's going to be the absorptive sunscreens and the reflective sunscreens. So reflective sunscreens work by actually reflecting the light off of our skin. And that's going to be the mineral-based sunscreens. Absorptive sunscreens work by actually absorbing the UV lights into themselves. Um, And those are going to be the clearer, sheer type sunscreens. For children, I usually actually recommend the more mineral-based or um, reflective type sunscreens. So that's commonly going to be something like zinc oxide. And I recommend that you choose a sunscreen that has at least SPF 30 or greater. How do you kind of apply sunscreen? What's the proper way to do it? So really, you want to apply the sunscreen to the whole body um, about 15 minutes before you go outside because sunscreen actually needs time to dry onto the skin. Um, so just get the sunscreen on but, you know, about 15 or 20 minutes before you plan on having your child outside. And you want to focus on a few areas that I tend to see get missed, and then they wind up in the office with a sunburn. So that's going to be actually the tips of the ears, um, the hands, the tops of the hands, and the tops of the feet, as well as the creases of the neck and the back of the neck. Those are kind of places that sometimes get missed. You want to just make sure you get those nice and covered um, adequately. The other thing to kind of think about is reapplying sunscreen. So after you go into the pool or into the ocean, you want to reapply the sunscreen um, as soon as you're dried off and then kind of every couple of hours throughout the day. The other kind of things you want to be mindful of is the time of day. So especially between 10 a.m. and around 2 p.m. when the UV index tends to be the highest, you want to think about having protective sun clothes on your child. So those are going to be things like sun shirts, wide brimmed hats, or just keeping them in the shade. So having um, a shaded area for them to play in, putting a sun umbrella out or umbrella over the pool throughout swimming in the pool to give them a little bit of shade during those highest UV index times. So why do we care so much about protecting children from the sun outside of the fact that sunburn is um, painful and uncomfortable? So there's pretty good data that shows the number of times a child has a blistering sun rash greatly increases their risk later in life for skin cancer. So we're really protecting them now as children to prevent skin cancer when they are older as adults. Um, So again, the more times a child has a blistering sun rash, it greatly exponentially increases their chance of skin cancer later on in adulthood. So typically, sunburn does not cause skin cancer in children when they are young children. So let's just talk about some of the types of skin cancer that sunburns can cause. So the main types of cancers that are caused later on in adulthood are going to be squamous cell carcinoma, basal carcinoma, and melanoma. The first two, squamous cell carcinoma and basal carcinoma, almost exclusively occur in adults. Um, squamous cell carcinoma is going to look like a often a growth that's flaky and basal cell carcinoma often looks like kind of a gelatinous mole that's more pinkish. Um, both types of cancers are usually not invasive, meaning they are local cancers to the skin, but typically do not um, invade through the skin and spread. Um, and again, they're almost exclusively seen later on in adulthood. Melanoma is a little bit different. So melanoma is a rare childhood cancer, but um, a significant one when it occurs. So melanoma overall accounts for about 3% of all pediatric cancers. And again, melanoma, the risk for melanoma or malignant melanoma is increased by the number of blistering rashes that a child has early on in life. But there are other risk factors for melanoma as well, such as genetic risk factors. The hardest thing I find for parents and clinicians 
um, when it comes to pediatric melanoma is distinguishing between a mole or a congenital nevi um, and a potential concerning lesion that might be concerning for melanoma. So we use something called the ABCDE to screen for melanoma. The most important part of screening for melanoma is ensuring that your child has a full inspection of their skin head to toe annually by their pediatrician. So that means that your baby or your child should be getting basically down to their underwear in a robe and having their full skin examined at least on a once a year basis. So what type of moles are more concerning for melanoma? Again, we were talking about earlier the A, B, C, D, E rule. So A stands for amelanotic. So a melanoma or a, a mole that is not the typical brown black color that a mole should be. B stands for bump or bleeding. So if they're particularly raised or they are bleeding on their own, so they're not, uh, there's no trauma to the area and they're unprovoked bleeding, that's another concerning um, factor for concerning when a patient should go see a dermatologist and potentially have a mole removed to see if it is um, actually melanoma and not a congenital nevus. C stands for color. So the color throughout the mole should be the same. So if it's brown, it should be uniformly brown. If it goes from brown to black to blue um, and has changes within the mole itself, that's also a concerning risk factor potentially for melanoma. So that's one lesion that should be then referred on to a pediatric dermatologist and potentially removed. D stands for de novo, so new moles. Most children um, are born with moles. They're going to appear within the first six months of life. So any new moles should definitely be watched. And then D is also for diameter. So the size of the mole matters. If it's a very large mole, that is one that should be, again, watched by your clinician to see if it is one that needs to be evaluated by a pediatric dermatologist and potentially removed. And then E stands for evolution. So moles will, especially congenital nevi, will grow with children as they grow, but they should not be rapidly changing, rapidly growing, changing in shape or color. All of the kind of changing characteristics should be monitored with your annual skin exam, and if there's something changing about your child's mole, you should bring it up to your pediatrician and see if it's something that, again, needs to be referred to a pediatric dermatologist and potentially removed. So let's also talk a little bit about who's at higher risk for melanoma. So these are patients that I might have um, come back and actually do a skin exam twice a year, um, or that I might say be really extra cautious about exposing this child to sunlight, especially in those high UV times between around 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So children who have fair skin, who have red hair, who have light colored eyes, are all going to be slightly higher risk for developing melanoma, but that doesn't mean that children with dark skin or dark hair or dark colored eyes are not. Um, Everybody is at risk if they have significant enough sun exposure and bad enough sunburn, but they are just at slightly higher risk. Other children who tend to be at risk for developing melanoma are those with um, some types of immunodeficiencies, the most common one being IBD, so Crohn's, um, ulcerative colitis, any kind of autoimmune disorder that affects your immune system puts you at higher risk for melanoma. There are certain um, rare genetic diseases that increase your risk for melanoma. Um, again, as we were talking about at the beginning of this session, sunburns, particularly earlier on in life, and those that are blistering, um, increase the risk for melanoma exponentially, and then the number of times you have those types of um, blistering sunburn. Additionally, family history of melanoma is an important consideration. So if you have multiple family members or even a first-degree relative or second-degree relative who's had malignant, malignant melanoma or melanoma, that can increase your risk. Um, having multiple moles, so having several, you know, several hundred for sure, but definitely having many, many moles can increase the risk for melanoma, and those should be watched carefully by your pediatrician on annual um, examination having these kind of atypical moles that we talked about earlier, so either very large moles or moles that are changing or an um, unusual color can increase the risk. And then any child who's been exposed to radiation therapy is at slightly higher risk for melanoma. So how do you really watch and do a proper skin exam in your child to see if they have any moles that are concerning? So again, you want to get them undressed, check head to toe, you want to check between their fingers, um, on the digits on the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, um, and you're looking for any of these dark colored moles, and if any of them seem unusual, so they're very large, 
They're not symmetric in color. They're raised or bumpy. Um, they're not the typical color. You wanna bring that to your pediatricians, um, up to your pediatrician at their annual well child check. And then usually I actually recommend also taking a picture of your child's molds and just documenting them because sometimes it's really hard to tell um, when you're with a child every day if the mole has changed, if it's changing slowly. So it can help to kind of take a picture once a year and see has this mole changed significantly in the last year. Um, certainly for all of my patients, we take a picture of the moles and we keep them in the charts so that we have something to then look back at um, a year later and really compare that the two and see if there's any significant change. And then there's a couple other types of birthmarks or congenital nevi that I just um, routinely recommend get seen by a specialist. So those are, again, the ones that are very large. Um, those that are around or near the eyes should be checked by a specialist. Um, those that are an atypical in color, so if they're not the typical brown color, they're more... Um, blue or white or um, like blackish purple, those are unusual colors. A caveat for the blue, I should say, is there is a very common congenital um, nevus that is usually found on the back um, and usually fades in the couple, first couple of years. So those um, congenital nevi that are um, on the back and they're more purplish or bluish, those can be normal. So the location matters with that color as well. Um, if they are changing very rapidly, um, those are also ones that I kind of bring up and say, let's have this checked out sooner rather than later. Or any child who has many, many congenital birthmarks or congenital nevus, or um, a child who has a strong family history of melanoma, if they have moles, I'm going to have them see a dermatologist annually just to make sure that they are having their annual skin checked by an expert and having them removed promptly if they are um, concerning in any way, shape, or form. Other children who I recommend see a pediatric dermatologist annually for skin checks are, again, children who have some underlying autoimmune um, disease or immune disease that's affecting their immune system. So those, are, again, are going to be commonly the children with something like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, to name a few, who should really be seen by a dermatologist on an annual basis to get those skin checks. Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.